One comment during the break was about uh, being barefoot, at least during your one hour of sacred time. Um, uh, where I grew up, uh, uh, I don't wear shoes between April and November, um, for sure, and then sometimes during the December through April period, um, or March. I'm not sure if anybody else has this experience of walking around barefoot, but um, I can't handle shoes. Boots, outside in the summertime, it's stifling. I don't understand how people can do it. So for me, there's a whole level of pleasure that you get in life when you're not wearing shoes um, that I think is really important. And I don't ever really talk about it. I just sort of assume it. Then I realize that I shouldn't assume it because most people probably don't do it. But thank you for bringing it up. So we talked about conductivity as a, as a general uh, principle and suggested that it would be something you would be monitoring or could monitor through the growing season and it would be a very proactive technique you could use. I said this is what you would like to see as your um, trajectory over the growing season and what you um, may likely see is something like this. And pretty much we can guarantee that pest and disease pressure is occurring right here. So if you've got your weekly monitoring going on you see you're plateauing, it's not raising that high, you're plateauing at a low level, starting to go down, uh-oh. You can see in this range, two weeks ahead of time, that something is going on that's not optimal. And that gives you the opportunity to get in there and do something about it. Um, what's that? What can we do? Uh, this is where common sense is required. If the soil is too dry, it can't conduct a charge, so you add water. Water is your limiting factor. Um, if it's been raining too much, this is what actually happened when we got late blight, uh, whatever it was, 2009, uh, the, for the first year, was we had a really cold, wet, um, rainy <coughs> spring. When it's cloudy out, then it's not sunny, right? When it's not sunny, then photosynthesis is inhibited. Uh, when photosynthesis is inhibited, then your plants aren't making as much sugar. That means they're not feeding the soil life very much. When it's raining a lot, a lot, things are being leached out of the soil, topsoil, into the subsoil. So um, if you had a situation where, uh, if you were an animal, say a human, and there was too much fluid passing through your body too rapidly and all of your nutrients were being leached out, you know, what would they, what would they call that? A giardia, a bad case of giardia, right? Is di diarrhea, it kills hundreds of thousands of people every year. People know about this, diarrhea? 300,000 people every year dead from a bad case of diarrhea. <coughs> Basically, it leaches out your electrolytes, and if you don't maintain certain, you know, potassium and sodium and things like that, balances in your blood, you're dead. So if it's raining too much, and functionally your plants have diarrhea, then uh, what's the cure for diarrhea? Well, there's somebody, I think, got a Nobel Peace Prize for inventing the cure for, for giardia, which is a little 10-cent electrolyte packet. A little bit of salt and sugar crystals in a packet, packet is all it takes to keep your three-year-old with a bad case of giardia from dying. You need to maintain the electrolytes while the body's immune system, you know, is, you know fights off the, the, the pathogen. That's it. So a little bit of salt and sugar in the field will keep the conductivity up when you have a, you know, when you have a situation where things have been leached out due to too much rain. So this is what we gave people as a recommendation in 2009 when the late blight was going all over and people were flipping out. We said a quart to a gallon of molasses per acre and three pounds of sea salt per acre. Solubilize them in water, put them out through an irrigation line. It's already wet enough, doesn't really matter. A little more water is not going to hurt anything. What you want is you want that conductivity to go up from 20 to 200. And when you're able to do that, so the tomato plants were, you know, starting to fruit. They're pregnant teenagers and they have no food to eat. And guess what happens to pregnant teenagers or pregnant women at all when they don't have any food to eat? Anybody been around a pregnant woman before? <laughs> right? It's really important that they are able to stay on top of eating on a regular basis. And when they're not able to stay on top of eating on a regular basis, they fall apart. It's not complicated. Conductivity is low, pregnant woman's unhappy, bad things happen. So you can use conductivity as a monitor. It depends on the environmental conditions. If it's been cloudy and rainy, then probably, you know, adding something would be the solution. If it's too hot and dry, then water is the solution. Um, you know, this is only helps you focus your mind on this problem here. 
and then you have to use your common sense and critical thinking skills to figure out what the best strategy might be for addressing that imbalance. But at least you're, you're given a, you know, a metric that you can follow that'll help to give you um, guidance. Uh, this is again one of those things where after you start doing it for a couple of years, um, you don't really need it anymore because you've learned you know, basically what's going on and how these things play and you can be monitored over different time and environmental conditions. So it's not something you should need forever, but for a couple of years to help get comfortable with these kinds of things, I think it's a valuable technique. I'm bringing this up now because of the idea that you want to have a good conductivity reading in the soil when you put the plants in the ground. The idea is that in many cases you don't, so then what do you add to bring the conductivity up in the spring? That's what I want to talk about next. This bullet point here says apply planting and transplanting drench. That is something that you would water into the soil at planting or transplanting time. And I've got some ingredients here and I want to talk about how you can make these ingredients yourself on principle just so you're comfortable with the ideas. Before I go into that, has anybody ever, uh, in the process of transplanting, um, gotten a like a, a tub or something and put some liquid fish or some kelp into it and then dunked their seedling trays into the tub before going out and transplanting them? We want to you know, give your plants some goodies to start off with when you put them into the ground, but that process of dunking them in a tub, I think, is almost 100% backwards. If you were to take a root ball and soak it with nutrients and then put it into a soil that didn't necessarily have a hell of a lot going on, which direction do the roots want to go? Yeah. yeah. Which direction do you want the roots to go? Out. So where would you put the drench? In the trench. In the trench. <laughs> you put the drench into the soil and then you put the root ball into, the, in, into that environment and the roots are inspired to reach out. Right? Um, make sense? Everybody's good with that yeah. yep. concept? So if you're planting tomatoes, one every five feet, what I do is I make my little hole and I come through with a hose and I go psh, psh, psh. I just walk along. Or if I'm doing kale plants, one every three feet, I make my hole and I come through and I just, you know, I've got a little sump pump and a 55 gallon drum. It takes a little while, doesn't take that long. Um, and I just, I literally water each of the holes before I, I do my transplanting. Um, if you are operating on scale and you've got a water wheel transplanter, um, this is stuff that would go into the water wheel transplanter. This would be a perfect application of this process, would be to put these liquids into your, into your water wheel transplanter, if you know what that is. If you're planting rows of carrots or rows of beets or anything like that, um, you can make your row, you can put your drip tape into the row and turn the irrigation system on and put this through the irrigation system so you've wetted the bottom of the row with the goodies and then you can come through and seed and cover and they're going to have that base to work from to take off. All that makes sense conceptually? So what are the ingredients you're putting in? Bacterial and fungal inoculants. I told you yesterday that I would teach you today how to make your own inoculants and that's what I want to do right now. Um, I said you can certainly buy these things and they're really inexpensive and they last for a long time and it's a great deal. Um, but on principle I like to give people options that don't involve money but options that are like what you can do in your local environment because I am thinking about strategies for the planet, not for comfortable North Americans. And so the principles need to be, you know, viable for the planet for me to feel comfortable presenting them. And so making your own inoculants is a, it's a, an exciting process. Um, what I'm going to be laying out here, if you want more information on it, you would do a Google search for the term IMO indigenous microorganisms and then once you've found that you're going to find all kinds of other stuff and you're going to go down the rabbit hole about inoculation and you're going to get totally overwhelmed um, which is all exciting and you can do all kinds of experimentation or you can say okay so Dan gave me a real simple process I'm just going to do that <laughs> and then we'll deal with the rest of it later. So the real simple process is you are obliged to go for a walk and uh, bring along with you some sort of a container, a plastic bag, a five gallon bucket, um, I don't really care what it is. Um, your walk should hit as many microclimates as possible. Field edge, forest, swamp, stream, pasture, meadow, and what you're doing is you're looking for plants that have shiny leaves. We talked yesterday about plants that have shiny leaves or plants that are fat and happy. They're fat and happy because they've got good, well-established gut flora. So then therefore, any plant that's got shiny leaves is a plant that you could go and take a handful of soil out from underneath and harvest a spectrum of vibrant, vital, 
local microbiology and you basically take a handful of soil and put it in your bucket. And you proceed through as many microclimates as possible looking for leaves that are shiny and, and you know, taking a handful of soil and putting it in your bucket. And when you get back home, you've got a mix of a broad spectrum of you know, well-functioning microbes in this environment from this soil type um, that, are, that are alive and well. And you basically are going to be harvesting those by adding water, stirring it up, letting the solids sort of fall to the bottom, and then you pour that water either into a watering can and water your seedlings with it, or your seeds when you're planting them, um, or you can put them into an irrigation line if you want. Um, you know, whatever is appropriate for you, for your structure, for your, for your system, um, the scale doesn't really matter. The idea is you want, once you've got this soil with life in it, and you've added water to it and stirred it up so the life can basically get off the soil into the water, and the soil is dry, has, has precipitated to the bottom, um, as soon as you add the water, you've got four hours, basically. Um, until these, the um, air is gone, until the people that are in there have breathed up all the oxygen, the dissolved oxygen in the water, and then once they breathe up all the dissolved oxygen, they die. So once you add the water, the clock starts. Um, and you want to get them into the ground as soon as possible. Um, but this is a really simple process. Um, if you were wanting to harvest um, foliar species, species that would go on the, the foliage, um, you do the exact same thing except you take the shiny leaves themselves as opposed to the soil from underneath the plants. You take your bucket, you get, you harvest your, get the, get the leaves, you go back home, you cover the leaves in water, you sort of stir them all up, pour it into a backpack sprayer, and you can go and you can spray the foliage of your plants with these microbes that you just harvested from your local ecosystem. Very, very simple. Um, no money involved, really, unless you have to drive to your walk and then you need a car. But other than that, um, you know, I think uh, this is a technique and a process that can be um, done by just about anyone. Um, actually, that's not true. <clears throat> I go around the country and speak in other parts of the world, uh, the country thus far. Um, like Southern California, they don't have multiple microclimates. It's like one big <laughs> bleh, you know, like, I keep telling everybody Appalachia is where it's at. Appalachia is, you know, there's just so much nuance and vitality and the land is just better, you know. Um, anyway, so it's easier around here to do it than somebody in L.A. They're going to have a hard time finding a stream and a forest and a field and a, you know, swamp. Anyway, yeah. What's your soil to water ratio? Soil to water ratio? You know, you're probably talking about the bottom third of the bucket being full at the most. Uh, leave at least a gallon's worth of space at the top of the bucket so when you're stirring things up, it doesn't all flop off into the ground. Um, um, different of the microbes are larger, so they're going to precipitate faster. So you really want to be pouring off the water as soon as you can um, after the soil drops to the bottom of the bucket. Um, yeah, and depending on your irrigation system or you're using a watering can, um, you know, you just want to basically make sure you don't get stuff that's going to block the irrigation line. Yeah. Do you see any uh, benefit of aerating it and feeding it prior to actually just doing it in that manner? Interesting. Uh, aeration and feeding. I, um, I have to confess, I've never taken a Elaine course. Um, I've, uh, while I was sitting down with her a couple of days ago at her research farm, I am kind of ignorant when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, I was hanging out with a couple of the people who work with her. Um, God, this is Wednesday maybe? <clears throat> and they were um, actually consultants for the marijuana industry, um, uh, which apparently is um, using a lot of these compost teas and <laughs> um, doing things like putting, you know, nutrients into a tea and then, and then bubbling it. And these guys were, t were just like, just, Blasting! They were like these people. They're putting way too much in. They're getting anaerobic ferment. They get da 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 da. They get their mites. They get this is. Don't know how to make a tea. Um, I don't know about compost tea. Um, it sounded like from these guys who were working with people who were doing it that there's a big mistake that a lot of people who make tea make, which is they put too much food into the ferment. Um, and you got 12 hours of um, bubbling and too much food and the 
level of life in, this, in the water is going to skyrocket and all the bubbling you do in the world is never going to produce enough oxygen to feed all that life and you're going to get an anaerobic environment which is then going to be you know, a, a detrimental tea to be putting on. Um, I was like, huh, that kind of makes sense. Never thought about it that way. So uh, I don't know. Um, um, yeah, I think you totally, you totally could. But I think a lot of people who make compost teas um, are, uh, don't do it well. And in many cases, the act of doing the aeration and the feeding produces a product which is detrimental, not um, positive. So that's something that I just don't know enough about to speak categorically, but that was what these guys who were um, in the field and getting results and dealing with people's struggles uh, were saying. Uh, it was, it's actually, if you, don't, if you don't do it right, you know the whole, the whole moron principle? Anybody know the moron principle? People who put more on. <coughs> if a little bit works, I'll put some more on. Right? The basic idea that I was getting from them is the amount of food that should go into a compost tea is really small. And if you put too much in, you screw it up and you make it toxic. The cut to the chase, that's the basic essence of the point, uh, which I was not aware of. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> I guess, briefly, um, yeah. The fertility system video where Pat really describes how we do compost tea here and yeah. it's very detailed and it goes and shows our facility. You're welcome to check that out on the site to learn more. Cool. So once you uh, pour off that water, do you then um, add more water to dilute it to apply it on your field? Yes. Okay. So however it's going in, if it's going in, into a watering can because you're going to be watering your seeds at, at planting, that's fine. You can use it straight. Um, if I'm going to be uh, taking a 55-gallon drum that's going to be watering all the holes that I'm about to transplant, it would be two gallons of water into my 55-gallon drum. Okay. Um, if I'm just, you know, watering the field, I can put it in my big 300-gallon tank, um, you know. So yeah, it would be diluted down to be spread, however that would work. I guess proportional to the bigger area you're doing, the more you would need to collect and get off water, or is that five-gallon bucket? I don't know. <laughs> the real question is how often are you going to go for a walk? <laughs> it's a great idea to go for a walk, but it's midsummer. It's time to plant. You got eight things going on. Are you realistically likely to go for a walk, and amble for 45 minutes through multiple microclimates? <laughs> that's my limiting factor. Is I'm not realistically likely to go for a walk, so that's why I buy inoculant. So you just you just take that one collection, add water, and then. I have done this, but I don't normally do it. I normally just use inoculant that I buy in a jar. I want to teach you how to do it, so you are oh, so you're conversant with the concept, and some people have the space and time in their lives to do it. I think it's a great thing to do. But you got two ways of, you can either go and make your own inoculants or you can buy inoculants. Either way, the inoculation process is critical. And I'd like to get something into the soil when I'm planting or transplanting, just on principle, because I think it's important. Not that I necessarily need it, but it makes me feel good. I don't always do it, most of the time. All right, that's inoculation. Sea minerals was the next thing on the list. I talked about sea minerals yesterday. Seawater has 92 naturally occurring elements. The full spectrum um, of elements on the planet uh, in levels and ratios very similar to amniotic fluid. Um, there was also the comment about the um, Romans um, salting the fields of the Carthaginians. And we have this idea sort of down through history that salt is bad in the field. Um, um, and so there's a middle ground here, which is you can take the salt out of seawater and still get the trace elements. And the only thing you, you need to do that, basically, is lye. Um, so people know what lye is. Um, in the olden days, they made lye by running rainwater through wo uh, wood ashes. Um, when I was a kid, we made all of our soap with hog fat from our pigs and lye. Um, lye is a very caustic agent. You can make your own lye with wood ashes and rainwater. If you're going to be making this yourself, you're obliged to go to the ocean. You're not obliged to, but it's a good excuse to go to the ocean if you want to. Um, so the idea is basically you um, just walk me through here with this in a you know in a concept. Um, you are on farm time. You are obliged to uh, go and harvest this critical you know um, mineral supplement for your for your farm. So you uh, you drive out to the ocean. You bring a 55 gallon drum, a five gallon bucket, some lye, a stick. You can probably find a stick, um, and some pH paper. Um, and you set up your 55-gallon drum above the high tide line. 
you get your five gallon bucket and you fill the drum up with seawater. Um, you take your stick and your lye and you start you know, stirring the lye into the seawater until the pH reaches 10.4. Um, when the pH has reached 10.4, which doesn't really take that much lye, um, you are obliged to spend 24 hours camping, ambling, doing whatever. Um, you need to wait for the trace elements to precipitate out from the sodium chloride. Um, uh, something like 96% or more of the salt in seawater is sodium chloride. Something like 2 or 4% of it is the other 90 elements. So um, they will, in this case, the cream will fall to the bottom. It does not rise to the top. The cream falls to the bottom. And so you want to siphon off the sodium chloride water off the top. And then you just are going to harvest, capture um, the, the two or four gallons at the bottom of the barrel, actually be one or two um, gallons at the bottom of a 55 gallon barrel. Um, and then you take that home and that's your trace element rich concentrate. Um, and that applied at a pint per acre as a foliar spray is a rocket fuel, a quart per acre into the ground on a regular basis. Uh, you're giving, uh, it's an amazing material. Um, um, uh, <clears throat> certainly you can do this with just straight sea salt. You can add water to sea salt and make seawater and then do this process if you want. You don't have to go to the ocean. It's a great excuse to go to the ocean if you're looking for excuses. Um, um, but this will uh, you know, provide your plants the full spectrum of, of elements, um, um, which I think is really helpful for all the enzyme systems and all that kind of stuff. So uh, this is something I would be putting into the uh, into the into the wall into the ground when I plant and transplant, um, you know something like a, somewhere between a pint and a quart of this per acre. Not a lot, just a little bit is plenty. Um, okay, so that's so it's liquid at the bottom that you're pulling yeah, out. Yeah, it's a fl it's a it's a it's a milky colored milky. Uh, fluid. Yeah, it's. And how long did we wait? Twenty four hours. And if I'm doing this with sea salt, <coughs> the whole process with the lye, or is the sea salt ready? Once you've added the water to the sea salt, then now you have seawater. Now you can begin the process. Uh, the next one is calcium and phosphorus and traces. Um, calcium and phosphorus are critical for root development. You really want that plant's roots to be reaching out rapidly um, uh, when you put it into the ground. I will oftentimes uh, take the um, take a seedling that I have planted. Um, 24 hours after I plant it, I'll gently dig up one and you know, reach around the root ball, reach up, you know, get some of the soil that's around the root ball, and I want to pull that soil back, and I want to see a fuzz of new roots reaching out from the root ball into the soil 24 hours after I plant. If I have created an environment where that plant is excited, it will, it will reach its roots rapidly out into the soil. Um, I've seen this numerous times, 24 hours later, a fuzz, like a, you know, like a wool hat, static electricity, fuzz. Like, it's just amazing to see this. Um, when you have that, you know, excitement for the plant, uh, you get some amazing results. In many cases, when people put their plants in the ground and they don't do anything for a while, their roots haven't reached out. You can dig them up a week later and you'll see almost no root growth from this root ball into the soil. Calcium and phosphorus are critical for root development, root growth. Calcium and phosphorus are both, you know, famously poorly available. Um, uh, calcium does not is sluggish and doesn't like to move. Uh, phosphorus is tied up and unavailable. Um, if people know about these elements, I mean, both these elements are, are famous for, for being difficult to move um, unless they're in a soluble form, which we're trying not to do. So, um, so I would recommend the use of rock phosphate uh, as a material that can help um, sort of bridge that gap. Specifically, colloidal rock phosphate. Um, the most local source is uh, Florida. Uh, Calphos is the product, C-A-L-P-H-O-S, it's a brown paper bag usually, classic um, 030 Calphos, colloidal rock phosphate. Colloidal basically means it's got a really, 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 really small particle size. Um, so you can take a couple pounds of colloidal rock phosphate, stick it in a bucket, add water, stir it up, and you'll find that that, that water will stay cloudy for hours because the rock phosphate is standing in suspension. It's so small, it's standing in suspension. So you take that cloudy water and you put that in your mix and you basically added really, really, really small particle size calcium and phosphorus into this environment with the microbes and the sea minerals and you basically have the necessary pieces for the soil life to rapidly access it and feed it to the plant. Um, so we're, we've, we've created the environment where it's not a lot of extra work for the plant to begin to, you know, 
digest its own calcium and phosphorus so that it'll be in the habit of doing that so that it can do it better into the soil later. So, yeah. You're putting this into the whole little trench before you plant? I, they're all being mixed up together. Yeah. Um, and probably, actually, if you want to know the truth, um, there's a bunch more stuff in there, um, too. These are some of the critical components. Um, as always, whenever you're doing, um, you have a salt, a soluble salt, uh, you want to be putting, you buffering it with some sort of a carbon source. I'm a big fan of liquid humates. Um, people can usually get humic acid or fulvic acid. Um, that's fine. I like to just the straight up humates like pulverized. They're full, the full humic quotient. Um, if you had some uh, finely powdered biochar, that would probably work as well. Um, um, but yeah, whenever you've got a salt, uh, you, you, you best practice is to buffer it with a, with a carbon source. But uh, my experience is you make this mix and you go when you start watering it into the holes and your conductivity goes from 30 to 200 just like that. And the question about how much you put in, use your conductivity meter to see. How much, is, how much water does it take to go from 30 to 150? How much water brings it to 300? Okay, what are, we, what, what are we trying to do? So that, 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 those are your metrics. Those are, the, those are your ingredients. Those are your metrics. Um, these are just some things. And, you know, if you have other things you want to put in that hole, knock yourself out. Um, I'm just giving you a couple of foundational pieces of the puzzle um, that I think are helpful um, and some of the reasons why I think they're helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you cover enzymes and I blinked? Or? No. You just heard me thinking about it, though. <clears throat> you just heard me thinking about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, much of the farming process for me is a really slapdash right. glug 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 eh, about that much. Um, I talked about cooking yesterday mm -hmm. and that feel you have when you're putting things in it's like eh, about that much. The real answer as far as I'm concerned is ask your soil and most of us are not in a place with our own development to be able to listen and get the easy answers so then we're stuck with no how do you figure it out? You can buy these products. You don't need to make them yourself. You can say, okay, look, the, on the jug it says, you know, two quarts per acre. I'm going to put down two quarts per acre. Um, you can experiment. You can say, I'm going to put a little bit here and a lot there, and I'm going to learn for myself what too much looks like, um, get a feel for it. Um, yeah, uh, or you just do the sort of the glug glug feels about right. Um, <clears throat> there's a pretty wide variance uh, for what's fine. You can get away with. Um, um, in many cases, uh, I, don't, I will not make all this stuff myself. I will actually buy a pre-made pre jug of concentrate um, of all kinds of these goodies, um, which are also available. Uh, so you can make these things or you can buy them. Um, and yeah, something like a gallon of concentrate per acre is what I'll be putting in. It's not a hell of a lot of material. It's not a hell of a lot of material. Um, um, okay, enzymes and the weed teas in general. I think I referred to this in a little bit yesterday, uh, but, but harvesting um, plants uh, and, and putting them in buckets of water and letting them ferment for a little while is a really powerful technique for taking the life force from things that you don't want and transferring it to the things you do want. Um, I haven't done this myself, but I heard people talk about uh, pruning tomatoes and taking the tomato prunings and putting them in a bucket of water and then, f and then watering that water to the tomato plants two or three days later and seeing massive increases in growth. Um, I would suggest any plant that grows vigorously. Um, we talked about kudzu yesterday. We talked about the um, um, Japanese knotweed. Um, any, you know, pigweed when it's growing three inches a day. Um, and, you know, any, any of those plants that are, that are, that are growing vigorously, uh, that have, you know, lots of energy and vitality, instead of pulling them out and leaving them on the ground, you can pull some of them out and put them in a 55 gallon drum of water and um, let it sit for a couple days and ferment. And, you, and if you take that, that water that th they've been fermenting in, which is gonna be a little bit aromatic, and you water that into the ground, you're gonna see results in your plants that are pretty damn impressive. Um, so there's all kinds of books, there's teas, recipes, there's people are using um, nettles and they're doing um, comfrey and, you know, I mean, there's a whole, it's a whole wide world of opportunity here. Um, but if you can put some of that stuff in your mix, that's going to be quite potent, um, quite, quite valuable as far as I'm concerned. Yeah? On that topic, do you use uh, EM or any of the kind of effective? That was the first, first inoculant I ever used, like 12, 15 years ago, something like that. Um, 
And I have since moved on to these dry powder inoculants um, because they're a lot easier to work with and less expensive. Um, but I know people who are doing EM and doing Bokashi and there's Korean natural farming. Anybody hear about Korean natural farming? That whole, you know, making all these ferments and there's, yeah, there's, there's a whole world out there of all these different opportunities and products and techniques and practices and um, it's really interesting. So uh, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just sort of, this is a survey course, right? We're just surveying all the pieces of the puzzle and I'm giving you a little bit of a dive into each of them. Um, but if you follow any of this up online or with books or with people who are more knowledgeable, you'll find it's a, there's just massive amounts of information. So um, yeah, in principle. What's a good source for, for reading about this or looking? Uh, I, I mean, internet works usually pretty well. Uh, you just need to know which, which, which keywords to type in. Um, yeah, so. A PDF book you can download, Korean Natural Farming. Korean Natural Farming is getting a lot of, you know, play recently. Uh, EM was a big deal like 15 years ago. Um, um, I, IMOs are pretty much, you know, I mean, that's applied and practiced by many pe different people. There's the uh, compost tea. Um, so food web people, they're doing a lot of stuff, uh, making inoculants and you know taking the compost and making it, make, making foliar sprays out of it and stuff. Um, Just briefly, we have a two-day biodynamic course with Jeff Coffin and Amy <coughs> Hamilton, and Amy goes into the teas, a lot of the Steiner craps and one of the the horsetail tea, mm -hmm. yeah. fermenting that, and she swears by that she doesn't ever get the the late blood, and if she does, she puts it on, it straightens right out because she said it makes the life force move up because it gets too foliar and it balances out between the roots and so there's some great tea prep description and working with it in that two day biodynamic course. Which you guys have an amazing resource of, is anybody else, I mean, appreciate the number of people that come through this place? It's ridiculous. I, I don't know who's doing it. Um, <clears throat> and then everything's being captured online and video and then made available. It's. This is not happening everywhere in the country. Million people have beat our horses around the world so far. Two point three million. <laughs> You're the excuse for the person to come so they can get videotapes so it can all go out across the world. But it's amazing what's going. This is not like normal. This is not happening in every state, right? Um, it's kind of cool. So yeah, amazing wealth of resources right here um, and stuff that's already been captured. Um, minor point about about horsetail. People know what horsetail is. Uh, Equisetum. Um, it's the uh, it's one of the one of the preparations in biodynamics. The plant itself is extraordinarily high in silica. Um, silica is critical for cell wall development. Um, any f of your fungal infestations generally are proceed by um, <clears throat> basically the fungal hyphae exudes a an enzyme which basically weakens the cell wall. It softens the cell wall and then the hyphae penetrates it. Um, a well-built cell wall cannot be weakened by that enzyme. So if the plant is actually building strong cell walls, and silica is one of the critical elements to do that, um, then you that's how you physiologically get fungal resistance. The, the blights and the mildews occur when you have good silica levels in the plant. And um, equisetum or horsetail is one of the best plants to make a tea with, or probably the best plant to make a tea with, if you want to, to do that. You can use the rock dusts and there's all kinds of other things, ways of doing it, but uh, horsetail is a wonderful material for that purpose, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so um, all that being said, you got your mix of goodies that you're gonna water into the hole and you're gonna and you put your seedling in. Um, you put your seedling in, you know, give it a good blessing, say thank you very much. Um, I, at that point, will uh, put my drip tape down, um, put my mulch down, um, and then I'm done. Then that's it. The growing season, you know, there's almost nothing left to do. Come by every now and then and check. Looks like it's getting a little bit dry. Turn the water on. You know, you want to feed them once a week because you like to feed your babies instead of letting them starve. Great. Feed them once a week. Do a foliar spray. Come and talk to them. But really, if you get your plants into the ground well and you have that nice fungal ecosystem, you got the biological community functioning, they will build roots and build bodies and proceed through their natural life cycle pretty much without much of your engagement. Um, there's not a lot of work necessary is the point I'm, I'm trying to convey. Um, as I was saying before, I grew up on a farm where we worked all the time. And you know, planting was just the first step in coming back and around and over and through and all kinds of efforts. And um, uh, from my perspective, you get that microbial ecosystem going well, um, you get the soil covered well, the weeds don't grow, the, the crop does grow. Um, it really, it really, um, 
I don't know, it makes farming a much more pleasurable uh, <laughs> occupation. So, I yeah. Know you said this, but you're feeding them, if you do feed them once a week, what is it that you're feeding? Uh, what is it that we're feeding them once a week? Um, I was going to be talking about that in a little bit. Um, we are going to go through after this section. The next section is plant visual analysis. How do you look at a plant and see what's going on with it, what it needs? Um, so there's all kinds of modulations that you can engage in. Um, but I generally have a one-size-fits-all goodie bag of, of minerals, uh, liquids, that I, um, I'll put down something like a half a gallon per acre in the soil as a, as a, as a weekly drench w through the irrigation line and something like a quart per acre uh, as a foliar spray. Now that's the idea. It doesn't always happen. I've been known to go months without doing foliar sprays. It happens many years I do that, go months without doing a foliar spray. If everything's doing fine, I'm like, well, well, they don't need anything. It's only when the end of the season comes and they're starting to get cold and they're starting to look a little bit beat up and haggard and I'm like, you know, it would be great to get squash for another month. And then I'll get the foliar sprayer out and I'll say, okay, we'll do some foliar sprays. Um, if I'm picking my greens, it's, it's high summer. My, you know, one 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 crop didn't germinate well. Um, I'm gonna. I've got orders for 200 pounds of salad greens, and I've only got 85 pounds coming in. Um, and I need to do a fifth or sixth picking on the stuff I've been picking for some time, but it's looking a little bit past its prime. The foliar spray will come out, and then three days later, all of a sudden, it's shiny again, and I can make use of things that I was otherwise going to let 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 go. So. Um, yeah, there, yes. If you don't walk to the woods and collect the shiny leaves, is there something you purchase? Is there something what? You'd buy? If I don't walk through the what woods and collect, collect, the collect the shiny leaves for the foliar spray? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. To be discussed privately. <laughs> you're not sell it. <laughs> I can tell you that most of the best things that we've found around the country are available through the mineral depots in almost all cases below market price. Um, there are some pretty good companies out there putting together products that you know make this whole job a lot easier and farmers that are working on 500 acres or 10,000 acres are not going to be doing you know this little <coughs> stew making process. They've got a budget. My budget is $200 an acre for fertility and so you know and this, this, a whole, this, is, this is how it's done on scale and what's exciting is that we have millions and millions of acres that are being managed biologically with consultants and products and all this kind of stuff. So we're doing the organizational, educational stuff and talking to people broadly about these principles, but there's a whole other community of people who are consultants and mineral distributors who understand these principles, who are, con who are working with major, major farms, major acreage, applying these, applying these principles. So um, it's great. It's great. Um, I was not aware of any of this stuff 10 years ago, and uh, even then a lot of the stuff was happening, but there's actually it's much farther along the whole process and the, and the products and all that kind of stuff are, are definitely out there. Yep. Yes? Back to the scenario in which you know, you, you've got an order, you're, for whatever reason your plants are uh, yeah. not doing well, so when you're dealing with... Uh, yes, yeah, they're not germinating. Well, so <laughs> specifically with uh, any kind of pest issue? Yeah. Are you, you know, have you ever used any, or do you use, um, you know, beneficial insects or surround or anything of that nature to deal with the current? Uh, the only thing I've ever used for pests is essential oils, which I understand to be basically plant immune system support compounds. Um, so I don't, I've never used surround, I've never brought in um, nematodes to, you know, do various things like that. I've never bought in anything like that. Um, I'm not opposed to it on principle. Um, you know, my thought is, I mean, we haven't talked about this yet, but, but the whole thing about the um, pollinator habitats and the hedgerows and the polycultures in close proximity and the, I mean, if you have a well-functioning eco ecosystem, um, in many cases you've got the predators endemic that can, that can take care of these things and you shouldn't need to, bur to bring this stuff in, to buy this stuff in. Um, I know with FISMA, people know about FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, this thing that went through a year or two ago that basically makes it illegal for anybody to grow food if you're not a, I mean, there can be no manure in the field, which means no birds can fly over, which means there can't be any rodents, which means you have to have a, an agricultural area, you know, miles wide with no life in it to pass the formal regulations, right? And this is, it is categorically and thoroughly ridiculous 
predicated on this assumption that, that germs are bad and bacteria are going to kill us, right? I mean, the whole thing is, is perverse. So um, <clears throat> in that kind of environment where you don't have pollinator habitat and where you don't have a polyculture ecosystem, then bringing in, you know, stuff, great. Um, and I, I know people who are, you know, good farmers who do bring these things in and do get results from them. Uh, I haven't done it myself. Um, I use um, essential oils are my like last ditch go to, and even when I've got them on the shelf, <coughs> I in many cases don't use them um, because I like to just let my plants figure it out. If I've got you know potato bugs in the potato patch, I just kind of like well there's only a few potato bugs, um, it's only hitting a couple plants. I want to let those let's take those guys out. Let's get the weak ones out of here. I kind of like it. I, that's I like. <laughs> <laughs> it's full-on survival of the fittest um, dynamics. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit about essential oils and you know, which ones you use, and is it just a tiny amount per or what have you? Uh, yeah. Again, um, you know, I think we've got some pretty good stuff lined up on the on the um, mineral depot list, and I can talk about specific products later if you'd like. But um, um, the stuff I'm using is a mix of like eight or ten different uh, essential oils put together by a guy named Jerry Brunetti, who's a Jerry Brunetti uh, recently passed from, uh, from Pennsylvania, brilliant elder in this whole world, um, did a lot of research and, and, and figured out some pretty good recipes for, uh, for essential oils that could really do some real plant immune system support. You're not killing the insects, you're making the plant healthier so it's indigestible to the insect is the, is the, is the concept. Yeah. Depending on where you live, as I said, like 2013, growing tomatoes in the rain that we had, like, I, again, I didn't know anyone that didn't have um, uh, blight. I mean, yeah. even the biodynamic lady said she was able to hold it off, but she ended up getting it as well. Everybody got it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in this area, uh, Mexican bean beetles is yeah. a great example. I mean, we actually don't have the predator. We, we uh, can purchase it and release yeah. it, but um, it's a big issue. And the idea of, of flea beetles, I love flea beetles because, all right, they're my nemesis, don't get me wrong. I love to bring them up in this conversation yeah. because, I mean, I truly have tried everything. And outside of netting, and Pat Battles is convinced that the nematodes eventually will have the potential to work. But it's just one of those situations where, you know, on principle, the idea that you can create a plant that has a cell wall which has so much water in it, so healthy that the, that the bug yeah. isn't interested in it, but practically speaking, I mean, using milky spore for a Japanese bean beetle, using, I mean, there's just almost these go-tos that they cost money. If I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't. But the idea is like, it, it almost feels like there are specific examples to where it's a romantic idea. It's just not like practically reasonable. I totally appreciate where you're coming from. When you're a farmer, theory is nice, you know, getting the crops to market and making a living is the, is the first priority. And so I'm not going to say anything bad about using some of these, you know, more holistic manners to address pests and diseases. I, it's, it's a continuum and you are where you are. And while the theory may be inspiring, you're not there, you're here. So we've got to deal with it. And I totally respect that. Um, I mean, I think the flea beetle has been one of the most pernicious, you know, issues I've got. I mean, pr pretty much every, all the rest of them are, you know, gone. I don't have to deal with them. And I only get to flea beetles when I have done, I mean, my experience is, I, I can, numerous times, I, um, <clears throat> I grow a lot of arugula. So I plant my arugula, it's July, it's not really arugula's season, um, but I, you know, 300 bucks a week, guaranteed 30 bucks, 30 pounds of arugula. I'm like, I'm gonna try to see if I can grow arugula. 300 bucks a week counts as money. 30 pounds, not that much. Like, I'm going to see if I can keep my arugula <laughs> supply going. So I plant my arugula. Um, it's, it's, you know, it was June and uh, it was hot out and um, we went to my parents' house for dinner and um, the soil dried out between when I planted and when it germinated. I can pretty much guarantee flea beetles will decimate that crop. If, however, I'm able to keep the soil moist between planting and germination, I can pretty much guarantee that even if they're right next to three beds of arugula that are being eaten by flea beetles, these ones won't be touched. I've seen that on my farm numerous times. I don't use Rime. I, um, 
you know, the idea that you can somehow make it a fortress where no flea beetle can get in. I mean, I guess it's possible, but it sounds like too much work to me. So um, <clears throat> I, I, I know what you're talking about, and I, um, it's a continuum. Um, and all these pieces of the puzzle, you know, if I save my own arugula seed, those plants are so much more resistant to flea beetles than the stuff from Johnny's. If I'm buying seed from Johnny's, which is, you know, one of the better companies out there, like, and, you know, the, the environmental conditions are not perfect, then I get, I get susceptibility. So we have to integrate all these pieces of the puzzle. You need the microbiology, you need the epigenetics, you need the mineralogy, you need the, you know, you, only when you have all these pieces together should you expect the, to, you know, get some of these larger system results. Um, so that's why I'm laying it all out there as a concept. Um, but, you know, not saying that you're a bad person if you're not getting the result. It's a continuum, and we're all in the process, and we're all studying, and we're all practicing, as far as I can tell. So I hope that's a sufficient response. Um, I do want to move on. So assessing plant status is the next um, section here, uh, middle of page two. So the next seven or eight pages are all slides that are pertinent to plant visual analysis, um, sort of seeing what you're looking at, being much more uh, present with uh, direct perception in the field. I feel like this is one of the skill sets that was um, very well developed in previous times and has been almost entirely lost. Um, I go to places like, you know, New York City and I get to hear about these, I'm being recorded, I should be careful what I say. Um, I usually feel free to say <laughs> what I think. Um, let me say this properly. Um, go to places like New York City <laughs> and hear about these people who are like, <clears throat> these amazing urban farmers and um, which again is one of those words that I just it's like junk food it's either junk or it's food it's either urban or it's farmer I can't quite get the two maybe it's just me um, so rooftop rooftop garden farm garden farm um, and uh, Everybody's like, they're so proud of themselves and they've been in the newspaper and they were on the TV station and like, la la la, we had urban farm. And you go up there and you look at the plants and you see these tomato plants, right? They're about yay big. They're fruiting. Their leaves are mm, that thick and about that long and purple. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> the body language of these plants is <laughs> not happy. Right? But people who don't know how to look at plants, all they see is tomato plants. Like, if you can read body language on a human, if you can read body language on a, on a cow or a cat, you can probably read body language on a plant. And so this is one of the most foundational pieces of the puzzle, as far as I'm concerned, is like, how are they doing? And people usually say, they're healthy. I can get the refractometer out and show you a BRICS reading of three, right? We can check the conductivity. We can look at the leaf shape and structure. I can give you 18 reasons why that plant is not healthy, but you see a green plant and you think it's healthy, and then it dies, and you say, but they were so healthy, and then they died. They weren't. They were showing all these symptoms of imbalance and, and, and something being wrong, and because you weren't able to perceive, you weren't trained, you didn't have the ex ex knowledge about the nuances um, you were just blithely, you know, going into it, and then, and then you got hit. So um, <clears throat> that's the idea uh, in general is what are the specific um, symptoms that you can perceive uh, that will help deepen your understanding and give you more proactive, um, you know, engagement possibilities. Before I talk about all that, I want to say one thing, um, which is... Um, you know, just the process of getting into it, of going out to the field and beginning to see um, what you're seeing. I think, in my experience, a lot of people go out to the field to start working and then they start working. And there's a moment which I suggest you take between when you get to the field and when you start working, which is that you stop and say, hey guys, how's it going? Um, what's up? Anybody ever walked into a hoop house in the morning open the door and been hit by this wave of like poof. it's like hey how's it going great morning <laughs> anybody a couple people know what i'm talking about <laughs> which of your five physical senses 
was used to experience that, that visceral like force, that like field of like, it wasn't, it wasn't smell, it wasn't taste, it wasn't sight, it wasn't hearing, it wasn't touch, nothing touched you, but you damn well felt something. Now, I propose that we are hardwired with the capacity to perceive on multiple frequency ranges, octaves, I don't care what the proper language is. I think, I mean, I think actually, if you look to the science of the East, which is only a few thousand years older than the science of the West, um, it's all been pretty well delineated. Um, personally, that really helped me get my framing straight going to the East and studying their science for a while. Um, and I, I suggest we are hardwired with the capacity to perceive all these things and we don't talk about it and we don't acknowledge it and we don't practice it. So they're basically like muscles that are out of shape. Um, and until we start to actively engage these faculties, um, we're going to continue to be, uh, you know, nincompoops. We're just we're ob oblivious and out of touch and dissonant. We, we have to engage these aspects of ourselves if we want to take things to the next level, as far as I'm concerned. So with a questioning attitude, ask, how's it going? What's up? Again, you don't need to say anything out loud. There doesn't need to be any ceremony. Somebody right next to you does not need to know what's going on. This is, a, this is an internal process done on a different level. It's not for show. Right? This is for actual, like, I'm feeling this, I'm thinking this, I'm intending this. Throughout the day when you're working with the crops, what comes to you? What happens for me is I'll be doing some repetitive motion, whether it's hoeing or weeding or picking or mulching or tying or whatever it is, and I'll get into some groove and maybe I'll, like, some lyric from a song will start going in my head. Like, they'll be like, dum, tuka, dum, tuka, dum, tuka, dum. like, there's five or six words that go along with a lyric and I'll be like, it'll just, I'll be grooving right along, right? And if I stop to look at that lyric, if I think about what those five words are, in so many cases, it's really interestingly appropriate to this, to who I'm working with. My mind will start wandering uh, onto some random topic. I'm like, and then I'm like, huh, I wonder why I've been mulling over this really random topic. I'm like, oh, interestingly, that could be applicable right here, right now. So in my little mind, when, my, you know, when, I, when I forget to pay attention and my mind goes somewhere, I'm, that's how they are able to get through to me. I'm not clear enough to be able to like, get direct communication, but I am clear enough to be able to you know, <laughs> get it when I'm not paying attention, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so um, I'm a, you know, I, I grew up on a, I grew up without a TV. Um, I, I'm the kind of person that when I have a TV, I'll, I'll watch it. So I don't have one in my house. Um, when our local sports teams make it into the playoffs, as they have a habit of doing recently, every now and then I like to be a you know red-blooded American male and go watch the game. So um, I'll go to the bar and you know have a couple beers and watch the football game or the basketball game. And um, if I was to say uh, at the bar somebody I was sitting down next to making small talk with that I was just talking to the divas of the tomato plants, um, I probably would get kicked out of the bar. I'm not sure what it's like down here. If you could talk about... <laughs> Whatever you... <laughs> that got a total response. If I said that I had a gut feeling about something, it would go over with no mention. So different people have different languages. You know, we have our different <coughs> dogmas, our religions, our, our theoretical constructs and structures. I don't really care what you call this. Um, I've got a few words written down, sentience, intuition, spirit, divas, kinesthetic, gut feeling. I consider them all to be synonyms. Right? They're different languages for the same basic thing. So whatever, whatever words feel comfortable to you, whatever you know, perspective you know, frame is, is, your, is comfortable for you, use that, that's what I'm trying to convey here. Um, so, um, but I w what I want to say is, in the process of going out and talking to your plants and looking at them and, um, and studying a bunch of these things which I'm about to go over, um, be re open to these other things that come to you. Be open to these random thoughts. I told you about Moira yesterday and the, um, the lemonade, mm -hmm. with lemonade. Like, why would they want lemonade? Doesn't matter. 
I mean, you can ask them if you want to, but the point is they told you and you heard them. That's awesome. Do it. How much do they want? Ask them. <laughs> what kind? Ask them. Right? This is not like there's no book for this. There's no regulations. This is the land where it's at right now in these ecosystems, in this circumstance, in this climactic condition, in this season, with these seeds, with what you've done. This is a unique moment. And every moment is, is you know, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into some, you know, um, you know, chart so easily. Um, so the more receptive you are, the more direct your co connection is, the more powerful your effect can be. Um, I think, you know, we can do basic, you know, add five pounds of this per acre and add a quart of that per acre. We can give you some rudimentary recommendations, but really, if you're able to take it to the next level, um, your power to effect is much more significant. Um, so just think about developing that. All right, so questions. I'm going to run through a bunch of questions here. Things that you can actually attend to, things you can look at. Are new growth tips standing erect? The newest leaves at the tip at the edge of the plant, are they like turgid and, you know, just like <clears throat> first thing in the morning? Are they excited about life? Or are they like, ugh, it's hot out. <laughs> What's the body language of the plant? How is it feeling about life? <laughs> I'm glad you're getting a little few more laugh lines today. Um, <laughs> You can go out and you can see. My wife will ask me in the morning, like, What's, what are you doing today? I'm like, we've been over this. <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> if you let me go for a walk, I'll come back and tell you what should happen. And if you ask me at the end of the day, I'll tell you what did happen. But between now and then, <laughs> I, get, I don't know. I got a few ideas. Like, I propose a puttering principle. I propose, anybody heard about the puttering principle? If I'm allowed to freely putter, Everything that needs to get done will get done and well, but as soon as there's structure and order and like times and all that kind of stuff, it really, it really gets in the way of things. If you follow my track around the farm on any given day, it'll be like one of those um, comic strips with a little kid, you know, like, just like yeah. family circle, exactly one of those. Like, what are you doing? I'm actually in the middle of eight things right now. I'm going here to get this, and on the way I'm picking up that to go there and do this, and I'm gonna check on these guys over here, so. They call it piddling down here. Piddling? piddling. Piddling, puttering, I, I don't care what you call it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like living large. That's, that's, about as, that's about as good as it gets. Freely puttering on your own land. It's just a wonderful thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyway, so yeah, you go out and you see what's going on and then you just make your decisions about what to do based on what you've just perceived. Do the honeybees work the flowers vigorously or the pollinators? Um, I've seen it happen numerous times where at some point in the season, they'll be fighting over a cucumber flower or whatever, and at other times in the season, they blow right by and ignore them, head off, heading off to the clover. Um, now, my understanding is that uh, um, if the bricks of the flower is not at seven or above, um, it takes more energy to uh, convert the pollen to honey than they actually get out of the honey in the wintertime. It's a net negative. Um, for the, for the bee, and so they will try to harvest the most nutritious pollen, and they can discern that. And there's a real connection between what the bees are fighting over and, where, and who's really vigorous and healthy. And anybody seen those flowers that come out of tomato plants at the end of the year? They're kind of like, Ugh. right? They're yellow, but they're just like kind of hangdog yellow, right? Those ones, there's a whole continuum in vigor and vitality in flowers, which correlates with the vigor and the vitality of the plant. And if you can't see it directly, well, the, the bees can. The pollinators will tell you who's doing well. And if, they're, if it's silent, if there's nobody around, and the plants are flowering, that's probably symptomatic of something being wrong. So um, just see how nature's responding to things. It does require sometimes sitting down for a few minutes and just being quiet and just being present. You can't be rushing to no notice this kind of stuff. That's why the one hour a week thought. One hour a week. Five minutes here, five minutes there, five minutes there. It's more than enough time to notice a bunch of different things. Is the plant growing rapidly? Um, in many cases, you put plants in and they sit there for a while. Or they grow and then they stop. Right? You, that's a sign of something being wrong. They shouldn't stop for a while. That's something wrong. You can engage that. You can, you can go over there and you can check them out and talk to them and you know, actively see what's going on. Don't just sort of swear at them. Oh, the broccoli haven't moved for weeks. <laughs> They're like... <laughs> <laughs> We're doing the best we can with what you gave us, buddy. <laughs> it's not our fault. 
<laughs> you want to come help out or are you just going to give us a hard time? Um, <laughs> strange how the labs sort of like <laughs> ebb and flow. Um, are the stems solid or hollow? Uh, this is most applicable on brassicas and, and grain plants, grain crops. If you, when you've picked a, a broccoli plant, it's too late at that point, right? You pick it and you see the stem is hollow. They shouldn't be. Um, grains, you know, any, any of the grains, the, the you know, forage, forage grasses or the, or, the, or the cover crops should have a solid pith in the stem. It should not be hollow. You should not be able to blow through a grass stem. That's a sign of a weak plant. High quality fodder, high quality forage. Um, you get many, many, many more bushels, uh, bales per acre. The, the uh, lipid levels are much higher. Um, if you're raising um, you know, cows and you're, you know, dairy cows or, 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 or steers, either way, um, high quality forage will be, um, if, you, if you actually are growing high quality forage, cows won't eat grain, right? They know grain's not right for them. The only reason they eat grain is because the food you're giving them, the, the, the pasture you know, you're giving them is, is insufficient for their nutritional needs. Um, you know, they will literally walk right by grain if the quality of the forage is high enough. And one easy symptom of that is the, is the pith, a solid pith in the stem. What weed families are dominant? Uh, this is a nice thing you can do. If you've got a field where you're growing you know, three beds of this and five beds of that and 10 beds of that, um, you can stand back and don't just look at the cucumbers or the tomatoes or the peppers, but you can stand back and look at the weeds in the field because you probably don't have no weeds in the field. You probably have some weeds in the field. What are they? Are they broadleaf weeds? Are they grassy weeds? Are they tap-rooted weeds? Um, you can see based on the families of plants that nature's choosing to grow what the environmental conditions are and, and sort of you know read her assessment of, of what's going on through that. Um, I think I told you about this book yesterday called Weeds and Why They Grow by uh, Jay McCammon, who's got all this stuff laid out. It's, a, it's one of the better books out there. I don't think it's great, but at least it begins to lay these things out. If you've got broadleaf weeds, if you've got things like pigweed and lamb's quarter and gallon soga, generally that's symptomatic of a bacterially dominant ecosystem, which means you've probably been tilling too much. Um, if you've got things like quack grass, any of the rhizomy grasses, um, that's soil that's too tight, um, probably uh, low calcium, maybe low boron, um, but th those are really you know, symptomatic of a certain type of environmental condition. If you've got the um, docks and dandelions, um, they're you know, breaking up uh, subsoil compaction. They're oftentimes a calcium um, bioaccumulators. Um, if you know what you're doing, if you know how to read the weeds, read the plants that nature's growing, she can tell you what the systemic foundational you know, imbalances are that are present. Um, in general, on principle, if nature plants something like a dock or a dandelion or something like that in my kale patch, I leave it. I call it polyculture. I call it cover crops. I don't call it a weed. Right? That is nature's way of balancing out the soil. This, this is how she thinks. I mean, this is her, her best strategy for improving things right here, right now. So um, if and when they get tall enough to shade out my plants, then I rip their heads off and drop them on the ground, but I don't pull them out and I let them grow back again. Um, on principle, this is sort of how I've chosen to engage, engage the process. You don't let us see uh, if you were to walk my fields right now, you'd see lots of plants that you might call weeds with seed heads that have been sitting there all winter. Um, yeah, I definitely let them go to seed. I'm uh, really bad about, I don't know, I don't, I don't care enough. I don't know. <laughs> if the conditions are right, you know, the pigweed, let the pigweed go to seed. If the conditions are not right for it, the, they, they won't go to seed. I'm growing in what used to be a hay field for 150 years, 200 years. I'm guessing there's a pretty good weed seed bank in that soil. And unless I till it and 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 till it, I'm not going to be able to get rid of that weed seed bank. And I don't really want to go through that process of stale seed bedding. It doesn't, it doesn't feel right to me. And so um, I try to minimally disturb the soil, keep it covered, put my plants in that I want to have in there, um, be sensitive to it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, um, you will definitely see big pigweed plants in full seed in the middle of my field 
right now that I could have pulled out at any time in the past six months, and I didn't because I don't really care. So when you go out there to plant that field, what are you going to do? Knock them down? Probably. Get them off the bed do your, and just leave them as part of the moment? Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. They're in the way. I'll knock them down. Yeah. Lazy, f I, I'm, like, I do as little as possible is my basic theory. Like, if I don't have to do something, I don't, I don't, if I don't see a need to do it, I won't do it. Um, um, I was forced to work long hours every day as a child for years, decades. I got this, like, you know, like, sometimes you resist things. You're, like, you're pushing back your, what do they call that? When you rebel. get old enough, you rebel. Yeah, I'm rebelling against work. Farm work. I like. I really don't like to do things that I don't feel like I need to do. So, how many flowers are setting per bunch? Early on in the, in the in the season, you might see the bottom of a tomato plant will have four or five flowers in a bunch. Uh, later on, it will go down to you know three to four flowers, and then it'll go to two to three, and then by the end of August, beginning of July, September, it'll be one to two flowers. You ever seen that happen? Right. There's a reason why the plant is choosing to change the number of flowers in every cluster. If you knew what that was, you could understand what the imbalance was and you could address it. Right? You don't know what that is and so you can't address it. You just think it sort of always happens that way. How thick are the stems? Generally, we'd like to have a, our plants have nice you know, trunk-like stems rather than thin willowy stems. Um, how thick are the calyxes? The calyx is the part that holds the flower and then ends up holding the fruit, the stem that holds the fruit, basically. Um, if the plant is planning on putting out a small fruit, it'll make a thin calyx. If it's planning on making a, a big fruit, it'll make a thick calyx. You can read the size of the fruit before the flower even pollinates based on the thickness of the calyx. There's all these really exciting, little, simple, obvious things that if you just pay a little bit of attention, you can see. Um, and then what's the causal factor and why the plant makes the fruit grow, grow smaller? Okay, great. We can see the plant is planning on having smaller fruit based on and we think it's probably this element, so we can address this element deficiency and we can reverse that process and not have to wait three months you know, to see it all transpire. So how thick are the leaves? Um, I think people have probably noticed that you know, sometimes leaves will be thick and stake-like and sometimes thick leaves will be thin and papery um, it, within tomato plants, within broccoli plants, within you know, squash plants. There's a, there's a variation in thickness. Um, which correlates with overall vigor and vitality. In general, the thicker leaves are what we're looking for, the thinner leaves are not what we're looking for. Um, I'm giving you a bunch of specific details right now and I'm not going into what the exact causes are because that's the next set of slides is the, this is a calcium deficiency symptom, this is a potassium deficiency symptom, this is the cause of the calcium deficiency, this is the cause of the potassium. Right now we're just going through ideas, things you may have seen, sort of general good and bad. What color is the sap? We're going to talk about the refractometer this afternoon, the Brix refractometer and getting Brix readings. And one piece of the puzzle to getting a Brix reading with something is you've got to squish it to get a drop of juice out of it to get the reading on the, on the meter. Um, so uh, that squisher thing, which can be as simple as a garlic press, um, if you uh, get one through us, it's a modified vice grips, which will get juice out of just about anything. Um, you can just take a leaf and you can squish it and you can see the color of the, of the sap the color of the juice that comes out, and the consistency. Um, you would like that, that sap to be dark, dark green, so dark it almost looks black. Um, that's really a really good uh, plant sap color. You'd like the consistency to be, you know, mucilaginous, slimy, sticky. You'd like to be able to have a drop of sap on your thumb and be able to put your forefinger on it and be able to pull, you, pull your forefinger up and it'll stretch. It won't, it's not watery, it's, it's more slimy. So slimy and dark, dark green are what you're looking for. Oftentimes you take a leaf that looks green and you squish it and you see the color of the sap is anything but slimy and dark, right? There's so many variations in the color green. How many words do the Eskimos have for snow? There's a bunch, right? We got one in English. No, that's not true. We got sleet, we got <laughs> freezing rain. There's a couple. Right? But, I mean, there are so many different colors of green that we all have seen, but we don't really know what they mean. What's the spacing between the nodes? The nodes is the branches, basically. So as the plant gets more leggy, there gets to be more space between the branches. That's usually a sign of hormonal imbalance, something you don't want. You'd like the, you'd like the spacing to be closer together. Um, that'll be symptomatic of a, you know, greater productivity, better root systems. Um, when you do begin to see it get leggy, that's usually a sign when pruning is appropriate. Um, pr pruning off the growing tips. 
How many petals are on each flower? I know in basic biology it's really clear. Yeah. Right? This plant has, is a dicot and the leaves are shaped like this and there's a number of petals in the flower. This is how we define things in, you know, like classical science. Um, has anybody ever seen a tomato flower that had like three rows of petals on it? Am I the only person in this room who's seen that? Yes, at least one other person has seen tomato flowers that look more like a sunflower in structure than a tomato flower. Now, I don't know what it means, but I've sure seen that a number of times. I've seen flowers on tomato plants that were not a dandelion that got thrown onto the tomato plant, but are actually stuck to the tomato plant <laughs> that have multiple rows of petals on them. I don't know what it means, but the more you look, the more variation you're going to see. The, it's, it, it's just really interesting. Um, somebody said it was called a king flower, but they still didn't tell me what it meant. Double, call it double. Double flower? Well, like a rose is double. double. And a daisy yeah. is a single. That's the basic biological. What came out like, but that would be like. Yeah. There's so many curious things to attend to, and never enough time to do with any of it. But um, yeah, you wouldn't think the number of petals on a flower would change, except then it does. I'm like, all right, fine. Let's just look and see what we see without any judgment. Stem size, bigger stem is better. Um, stem strength, stems should be able to bend without breaking. Anybody who's ever walked through a zucchini patch after, a month after you've been picking it and you know, like had this experience of like you just look at the leaf the wrong way and it goes pop. Um, that's not what you want, right? In the end of August, when your tomato plants are starting to really not quite be what they used to be and you just touch the stem the wrong way and it breaks right off. Now, that's not what's supposed to happen. They're supposed to, they're supposed to bend without breaking. Stem hairs, in general, stem hairs and leaf hairs are a good thing. Not all plants will have them. Some plants will and sometimes don't. So if you see tomato seedlings that are looking so fuzzy, they're like threatening to poke you, that's a healthy seedling. If you see tomato seedlings that look like they just got their legs shaved yesterday, that's probably not a healthy tomato plant. Right? There's a real nice correlation between hair, fuzz, fur, three-dimension antenna, good things. Um, if you've grown an eggplant that had a thorn on the middle of the leaf that could draw blood, that's a 3D, like, serious, serious, you know, that's more than a leaf hair. That's a thorn. Anybody been able to draw blood with a thorn on a... Yeah, they're dangerous, those little bastards. <laughs> and they don't all come out that way, right? I mean, in, within the same variety, different environmental conditions, you'll see major variations in this kind of stuff. Um, it's really interesting, really interesting. Solid stems and grains and brassicas, uh, hollow phenotes, connotes a functional calcium deficiency. We talked about that basically already. We'll talk about calcium in a little bit. Stem shape, round is preferred. Oblong connotes a functional calcium deficiency. People may have noticed in like a broccoli plant, you'll see sometimes the stem is more oval shaped than round. Sometimes it'll be round and then it'll be oval and then it'll be round again. You can see it vary in the plant. Um, so we can look at these kind of symptoms to see. Some plants are gonna have a square-like stem. They're never gonna have a round stem, so those don't count, right? But internode points, shorter internodes build stockier plants. Uh, we talked about that already. Leaf thickness, thicker is better. It facilitates greater photosynthesis and nutrient transport. Okay, so we're getting down into a few details here. Um, F, E, M, G, and K are associated with leaf thickness. For those who forgot their chemistry, Fe means iron, Mg may, means magnesium, and K means potassium. So I'm going to walk you through this here for a second. You see that your tomato leaves are looking not quite as thick as you'd like them to be. You know it's uh, likely either iron or magnesium or potassium. Um, you need to get your hands on some iron sulfate, some magnesium sulfate, and some potassium sulfate. Potassium sulfate is sulfate of potash, magnesium sulfate is Epsom salts, iron sulfate is iron sulfate generally referred to. Um, you take a couple tablespoons of each one, put it in a quart jar. Got your <coughs> potassium one, got my magnesium one, got my iron one. Fill that quart jar with water, put a lid on it, shake it up until you've got that salt dissolved in water. You've got a super saturated solution. You know, you want to keep adding it until it won't dissolve anymore, right? Until you've got some on the bottom of the bottom of the jar that won't, that won't um, solubilize because the water is saturated. Um, now you've got an iron concentrate, a magnesium concentrate, and a potassium concentrate. Um, now you do some experimentation. You take uh, a quarter cup of the potassium concentrate, put it in a gallon of water, and spray it onto these two plants. 
take a quarter cup of the potassium concentrate, put it in a gallon of water, spray it on these two plants, etc. Come back tomorrow. See what you see. Make your decisions based on what you perceive. Um, uh, in many cases with foliar sprays, if you have hit the element that is deficient, um, you will see a response in a bricks reading in hours. You'll probably see a response in physiology in a day or two. You'll literally be able to see the leaf look different in that much of a short period of time. So um, um, in general, when we're pushing through this all and we're talking about um, you know, the um, leaf sap color, magnesium boron, and potassium associated with this, this is the strategy. If you want to tease it out, if you don't trust your ability to talk to your plants and just ask them directly, which is of course the easiest thing to do, um, this is the way you this is the way you, you you logic it out is by experimentation, cause and effect. Um, uh, in general, as it pertains to foliar sprays, let me just say this now because I haven't said it yet, and I always want to try to say it. Um, um, if you're ever putting in a salt like this, buffer it with a carbon source. We talked about humates. We talked about biochar before. Um, a, um, if you're ever applying a foliar spray, um, I think the, the, my rule of thumb is uh, when the birds are singing is the time to apply foliar sprays, um, which uh, correlates with either 4.30 in the morning, when many people are not up and out foliar spraying, or 7.30 at night in the summertime. Um, so for me, generally, foliar spraying time is evening. Um, um, the idea here is that if you go and you take a soluble salt like potassium sulfate and you spray it onto the leaf of a plant at 10 o'clock in the morning and it's sunny out and the water on the leaf evaporates, then you have a salt on the leaf that can burn the leaf. Not good. People will do foliar sprays, they'll see the leaves get burned and they'll think that foliar spraying is a bad thing to do. It's not that foliar spraying is a bad thing to do, it's just that you did it at the wrong time of day. So for me, if I put a foliar spray down as the dew is setting, I've got all night long for that whatever is in there to be digested by the leaf on the by the life on the leaf and then be fed into the into into the plant, and I never have a problem with uh, any burning or anything like that occurring on the plant leaf. So, uh, general rule of thumb uh, when the birds are singing, general rule of thumb: a quarter cup of concentrate per every gallon of water um, will never be too too t intense, to, um, so that you have to worry about burning anything. Leaf shape. Shorter, wider leaves correlate with a higher productive potential in stockier plants. Who have seen on the bottom of a tomato plant these big, broad, blocky, glove-like leaves? And then on the top of that same plant, three months later, these little skinny leaves. Right? You have seen profound modulation in the shape and size of leaves, probably on an annual basis, and never gave it a thought, I bet in most cases. The shape of the leaf, the size of the leaf, has everything to do with the environmental conditions that plant is experiencing. Every single time it puts out a new layer of leaves, it is giving you a report about what its nutrient status is. And as you see those leaves get smaller, as you see them get more pinched, longer and skinnier as opposed to shorter and broader, it is reporting to you that it is suffering more and more. And you don't know because you think it's got tomato leaves on it and it must be healthy because they're green. Right? It is giving you a total readout of its nutritional status. So we would like to see the leaves stay broad and large through the plant. You do not want to see them get skinny or small. As they begin to get skinnier and smaller, that is a symptom of things going wrong. Um, and you can watch it through the, I mean, I've done this, this course used to be a six day course. Um, we thought it would be great to have it be through the growing season literally, and we, it would be great to have it be, you know, not all inside, but also outside also, also. So we would do half a day in the morning inside and then half a day in the afternoon outside. Um, what happened was people were not reliably showing up in the middle of the summer because they were farmers. So, um, and six days cost more than two days. So the price point was an issue. Um, but I remember some of those early courses going out into the field and looking at things like, um, I don't know, broccoli. And you could you stand at the end of a bed of broccoli and you can look down and you can see the bottom three leaves are yellow and the next three leaves all have flea beetle holes in them. And the next three leaves, you could see, you could basically read the history of the season in the plants. 
You can see how those leaves were developed, their size, their physiology. You can see when the flea beetles were out and, and hammering them. You can see when they you know, made it through and they started putting out different color leaves, different shape leaves. I mean, you can literally read the season in a plant if you know what you're doing. You don't need to have been in the area. You can literally read like the climactic conditions. It's so cool when you begin to, to see some of this stuff. Yes? You were talking about the digestibility of the plant. Yeah. Like, can a certain plant have different state, like as it goes through different stages of maturity or health, yeah. like certain bugs will only stay here and other funguses will stay here? Like, or does the plant, once it becomes susceptible, does the whole thing? It's a continuum. Um, some things will, if the plant builds strong cell walls and it's lower leaves, and then is unable to build strong cell walls in its upper leaves, there's, um, you know, the fungal infestations will just take out the yeah. upper leaves and not the bottom leaves. Um, um, so there's distinct distinctions and discernments in the actual It's layer upon layer of discernment, but basically when you begin to understand the basic pieces of the puzzle, you can start to put them together. Um, this is what I, I mean, I hope it's not sounding too complicated. Hopefully I'm conveying like, there's something you can work with here. If you literally spend an hour a week this year going out and looking at your plants and just seeing what you see and taking what notes you can and come back next week, um, I promise you the level of discernment that you will have at the end of this growing season will be dramatically improved. You'll be able to, it was, I mean, one of those aphorisms, see what you're looking at. Anybody heard that one? The only problem with farmers is they don't know what to, how to see what they're looking at. <laughs> If you can see what you're looking at, it's all right there. But you think you have to go get consultants and send things off to labs and, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what you're doing because you don't know how to look at a plant and see how it's doing. You can look at a human and see how they're doing, right? You can get a pretty good read on a human. You can read them, say a lot about somebody just by looking at them, not by ever talking to them. You should be able to do that with your plants also. You should be able to. Uh, leaf density, plants highly loaded with leaves have a higher productive capacity. Um, I am thoroughly of the opinion that leaves are used to make sugar and feed that into the soil. And the plants know better than I do about how many leaves they should have. Um, I am philosophically opposed to taking off leaves, um, pruning as it were, uh, unless there's a very good reason. Um, if you've jacked up a plant on a soluble nutrient that will cause it to grow lots of leaves, well, you should have not given it the soluble nutrient that jacked it up that caused it to grow all the leaves. You may have an imbalance, but that was because of your foundational mistake in the first place. So, great, pull off the leaves that you put on too many of. You know what I'm saying? Um, I've got a friend who's a, he's Italian, and he's a sweetheart, and he's a great gardener, classic, you know, Italian, and he was showing me his tomato plants. Look at my cherry tomato plants, are 12 feet tall. And, uh, he likes to exaggerate, but they were like at least 10 feet tall, which is not really a big deal for cherry tomato plants. Um, I went down there to see his plants and they were naked. And we know this thing where people take the bottom leaves off and they turn yellow. You ever done this? Bottom leaves turn yellow, you take them off, and then what happens? Next one turns yellow, and then you take it off, and then the next one turns yellow and take it off, and the next one turns yellow and take it off. Pretty soon, He's up above eight feet and there's like no leaves on the plant. I'm like, Sammy, what the hell are you doing? Like, well, they're turning yellow. I'm like, we've been over this. This is the soil's too dry and a potassium deficiency is causing the plants to suck the potassium out of their bottom leaves. This is not a disease. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, anyway, I think in many cases we do pruning. We take things off um, based on, you know, misunderstandings. Basically, as I understand it, if you want that conductivity to be high, in the soil, so your plant is fed well, you need leaves on the plant to make the sugar which feeds the soil life. Um, uh, we can talk about pruning of uh, perennials, things like fruit trees and things. I don't think I talked about that, did I? Not yet, no. Um, we have five minutes before lunch. Let me just maybe finish on that topic and then we can um, break for lunch. Um, so just a couple of points on perennials. I think you've heard me say a lot about, uh, about the early childhood development stage of life um, and the critical importance of it and uh, the ways in which you can really screw a plant up for the rest of its life if you do a bad job with the early childhood development stage. Um, I think a lot of, we'll just start with, with, with uh, grafted rootstock um, uh, dwarfing trees as an example. So 
you've got a dwarfing rootstock, um, which means that by definition, the bottom is always going to be smaller than the top. Right? We talked about that? Which is foundationally disharmonious, right? It's foundationally dissonant. So in that case, if you're setting up a, a, an imbalance between bottom and top, maybe then you have a, a logical argument for pruning the tree to keep it balanced. So that might be, that might be a case when that would be appropriate. Um, I think the way it's done in nurseries is they start these seeds in very close proximity. They germinate them. If you've ever, ever been to a nursery to see how they start rootstock, I mean, they're literally like basically elbow to elbow, these, these you know, the rootstocks. Um, they're, you know, seeds are right next to each other. And so they spend that first six months or a year in extraordinarily close proximity, which is going to have that effect of having them define downward their yield potential based on that. Um, then they're dug up, then they get their head chopped off and somebody else's head gets screwed onto them, then they get, you know, planted out for a couple of years, and um, then they get dug up again, uh, they get all their roots chopped off. Anybody ever, got, ever gotten a bare root seedling? <laughs> right, the top and bottom balance on that thing is not healthy. It is not close to healthy. In my experience with my parents' farm, you know, the best land was taken for the vegetables and then the high, dry, you know, bony ground was where the fruit trees are put in the hole. You take this baby that's been, <laughs> had a real painful childhood and you stick it in a not necessarily optimal environment and you say figure it out. And you wonder why you've got a hard, you have a hard time getting your apples to be disease free. Like why you have a hard time getting your cherries or your, your plums to not have curculio or, or peaches not to, you know, have their branches fall or whatever it is. I think a lot of the issues that we struggle with with our perennials um, start with the seedlings we bring in. And um, it seems to me much more natural to prepare the ground well ahead of time and plant seeds in the ground where you want the trees to be. Like for instance, uh, we make apple cider. Uh, we've got a bunch of volunteer apple trees. We've got 80 or 90 or 100 apple trees on our property. So we just go out and we harvest the apples. We press the cider. All that stuff that's left afterwards, the pulp, whatever you ma mash or whatever you call it, there's a word for it. Mast? Not mast. What's the word for it? Mash? And just mash? I would suggest you just take that mash, maybe dig a little trench, and, and just dump that mash in a trench in an area where you want to have apple trees and let them germinate there next year. The ones that have the best vigor and vitality, let them be and take the weed whacker to the rest of them. Let your plants germinate in the ground. Your peach trees, your pear trees. If you want to graft them, fine, graft them. But graft them in place on the roots that grew in the ground that never been dug up. If you want dwarfing stock, fine, take some dwarfing seeds and put them in the ground. I think it would actually be a hell of a lot cheaper to put in an orchard if you were just dealing with seeds and, and grafting. Um, you could put in 500 trees and it would cost you not much money. Um, the numbers on, you know, how many ap apples you can produce on an acre, what is it, like one to two thousand bushels per acre? If you got a, f a functioning orchard, organic apples, buck fifty a pound, two bucks a pound, mm -hmm. forty-five pounds per bushel. You get a lot of variability with planting your fruit and seeds. If you want to graft onto the rootstock that, that you've germinated, go for it. I'd have no problem if you want to graft, but just graft onto plants that dug their roots into the ground and have never been dug up. I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle, and it will save you thousands of dollars if you want to put an orchard in. But how do you know that that rootstock is actually a rootstock if it's coming from seed? Because it's going to be genetically variable too. Yeah. I mean, they're all made from clones. The top is the top is the clones. But the rootstock is too, right? They grow out of they they breed and select a tree, and then they make they make that from clones too, don't they? The dwarfing rootstock doesn't have seed. Yeah, I don't think so. I think because they'd have the genetic variability every time. Yeah, I kind of think genetic variability is a good thing. Um, I'm a big fan of seeds and open pollinated on principle. So, um, well, I mean, what yeah, I would... I, I can see it for standard, but how, how, would you, how would you count on getting dwarfing? That's what I'm wondering about. Yeah, and do you want dwarfing in the first place? I don't know. In general, the whole, there's a, a much broader conversation here. One little tidbit that I think is, you know, I'm pretty safe with. Um, there's this root that comes out of the bottom of the, tr of the sapling that oftentimes goes a little bit it comes down and goes this way. You know that one, the, the big tap root? My understanding is uh, trees, uh, plants in general, are sensitive to magnetic fields. 
Uh, they're planted in the, they, they plant into the ground and, they f and they're, they're tuned into the electrical field flow of the earth. Um, and that major route going out is, would like to be heading magnetically north. Um, so if you do nothing different, next time you get a bare root seedling, just try to align the basic route north because that was how it was born, that's how it's set up shop. And when you take it and you twist it and you send it off southeast, you've just taken it and you've just like, you know, it's like, my feet are going here, my head's going that way, you're, the whole thing is just twisted. So there's all kinds of subtleties here in the, in the conversation, in the broader conversation. Um, you know, I think uh, if you can create an environment where nature can take care of her business, um, a lot can happen with almost no effort. Um, people heard of Sepp Holzer in um, Austria. Um, I, think, I think Mark Shepard is doing this kind of stuff in Wisconsin. I think both of them are doing this, planting seeds in the ground, letting the plants grow, not pruning them, take care of their business, give them the space they need, lots of productivity, almost no effort. I think there's a totally different way we can do, we can do our perennials um, as well as our annuals. We just need to think through it logically. So, um, all right, I'm gonna break for lunch now, it's 12.30. We'll reconvene at 1.30 and um, hope you all had a good morning. <laughs>